You're listening to an archived Cabral Concept podcast. After listening to this show, check out the most up-to-date podcasts available at stephencabral.com slash podcasts or search directly on iTunes. And now, welcome to the Cabral Concept, where board-certified naturopath and integrative health practitioner Dr. Stephen Cabral shares how he was diagnosed at the age of 17 with a life-altering illness and given no hope for recovery. It was only after studying and traveling all over the world did he discover how to combine ancient Ayurvedic healing practices with state-of-the-art naturopathic and functional medicine to fully rebalance the body and re-energize it with life. It's time to discover how to get well, lose weight, and finally feel alive again. And now, here's your host, Dr. Stephen Cabral. And today on our Total Wellness Tuesday, we're going to be talking about all things coffee. So the question always comes up, and especially in a naturopathic wellness practice, which is what I have, doing functional medicine, Ayurvedic medicine, traditional Chinese medicine, every type of natural medicine there is, we, we package it up into one thing. And why do we do that? We do that because we believe, and I believe, that there is no one form of medicine that is best in the world. What we do, my philosophy is this. I studied all around the world, India, China, all over Asia, Sri Lanka. I studied in Europe. I studied in the United States. I did this very specifically to say, who has the best forms of medicine in the world? Whoever has the best form, that's what I'm going to use when I become a naturopathic doctor. And I did this for my internships. I actually lived as a resident in these clinics all around the world. I got to work alongside the patients. I got to see who actually got better because I had extended stays. I lived in these places for at least a month at a time. And I actually got to see, are these people getting better? Yes or no? Well, a funny thing happens. In every single one of the clinics I worked at, people were getting better. They were in every different form of medicine. So I said to my myself, how can this be? How can people be getting better from different modalities? Well, this was a thing, is that every form of medicine can be the best in the world when used with the right person at the right time. And that means when you go to a doctor, wouldn't it be great if instead of them only doing homeopathy or only doing muscle testing or only doing conventional medicine or only doing Ayurvedic medicine, they could put that all together. And that takes a lot of practice, right? That takes a lot of study. And that's why I didn't study, I didn't even start practicing medicine into my early 30s. And, and the reason for that was I said, I need to be able to help people get better. I need to be able to, I need to be that person that I didn't have when I was younger where they, no one looked for the underlying root causes of what was going on. No one had one different treatment plan to help me if I wasn't getting better. So now I looked at, well, what's this thing called bioindividuality? Whereas like, we know how to help this person get well, but there might have to be some tweaking along the way. And you know, because I was discouraged and a lot of people get discouraged because you know, like, it doesn't work in the first 48 hours, right? So you have to help people as well from a psychology-based standpoint. And that's why to me, this is the greatest thing in the world, the health and fitness industry. And that's because, you know, even as a um, nutritionist, as a health coach, as a strength and conditioning professional, as a personal trainer, as a natural doctor, as a functional medicine practitioner, you can't learn it all. Never, ever could you absolutely learn everything in your particular craft. There's just so much to read, so much to study. It's such a, you know, absolutely fantastic thing. And I know it went off on a little bit of tangent there when we're actually talking about coffee today, but it leads me into really talking about coffee. And that's, this is that some people like you should never drink coffee because of X. And then people said, coffee is the healthiest drink in the world. You should be drinking 10 cups a day, right? And then you should start blending it with butter. Well, here's the thing. You know, there's always some gray space in between. And also I want to really tell you that based on that little tangent I just went off on, coffee is great for some people, good for others, and then terrible for some. So let's take it from the top. Who's it terrible for? Let's get this out of the way. Okay. For anyone who is prone to anxiety, who's prone to feeling overwhelmed, jittery, panic attacks, or adrenal fatigue, you cannot drink caffeine in any form. That includes black tea or coffee or energy drinks. It might make you feel good temporarily, and you're going to feel so much worse after that. If you have any sleep issues, if you have any insomnia, if you grind your teeth at night, if you have restless leg syndrome, if you have any of these things in the body that show that the nervous system can't calm down, basically, if you have any neurological-based issues, coffee is not a very good thing. Why? Because I'm going to show you in a minute, coffee pushes the nervous system. Okay, It stimulates the nervous system. It puts you in high sympathetic nervous system drive. So in Ayurvedic medicine, 
Guess who coffee is not good for? The Vata body type, right? Right? Because the Vata body type is characterized by high sympathetic nervous system dominance, which is why they can eat twice as many calories as their endomorphic partners, their their kapha body types, right? So remember, you have to look at body types, so vitally important. Not really great for a Vata body type. Who would it be good for? Well, the kapha body type, the endomorph. Why? Because they're characterized by low stimulation, low metabolism, low adrenaline, low neurotransmitter output. Now, keep in mind, anyone though in this Western-based culture can be overstimulated. And remember, coffee is a stimulant. So that's what we have to look at. So again, if you're trying to recover from adrenal fatigue, why would it not be good? Well, it's going to be pushing your sympathetic nervous system and not allowing you to heal, right? So that's really, really important to look at. So again, the anxiety, because it's stimulating that nervous system, which is going to cause more anxiety. And the other thing I would mention as well is you have to think of coffee as this. If you're already exhausted. So the funny thing is the people who coffee is best for are those people who don't need it for energy. And that's the funny thing about it is because if you're exhausted and you're using coffee, well, you're literally drawing more energy from that energy bank. And I always give this analogy in my practice. Someone walks in, Coffee, good or bad? Okay. Well, this person's exhausted. So I'm going to say, look at this. If you ride a horse all day, you woke up at sunrise and you rode that horse and you rode for, I don't know how many miles you can ride on a horse, let's say 200 miles that day, right? That horse is exhausted. It's trying to lie down at night. It's trying to rest. If you whip that horse, which obviously would be terrible anyways, but if you whip that horse, it will get it back up and it will run again for you. That's what caffeine is. You can whip a tired horse and it will run. It will stimulate the HPA axis, the hypothalamus, the pituitary, the adrenal axis, and it will produce more adrenaline. Is that a good thing? I would say no, because it's burning you up further. You already don't have the energy, so you're tapping into an energy reserve that you really don't have. That's not really yours. You're digging too deep. That's exhausting. That's pulling more minerals from your body. So you do have to look at it that way. Okay, so now why could coffee be good for you? And then I'm going to give you my big summary at the end for what I do, what I can recommend to others is that a lot of people say, you know what, drink coffee because you're going to get antioxidants from it. And, and they do this study showing that the majority of Americans, their largest source of antioxidants is from coffee. And I would say, you know what, the study's correct. It absolutely is. There's a lot of antioxidants in coffee. But I would also say is that's pretty sad. That means the majority of Americans aren't eating that many vegetables, they're not eating that many berries or good fruits. And that's why you know, they're, the majority of their antioxidants are coming from coffee. That's not a good thing. That It really isn't. That's a bad thing. But there are a lot of antioxidants in coffee. So I completely agree with that. Okay. Now, the second thing is there's some good research showing that coffee can help stave off Alzheimer's and dementia. And that's partly because they're looking at the stimulation of the nervous system. Again, it all goes back to the nervous system and how that helps stimulate brainwave activity as well. So I would look at it in, in that particular way. Now, and also antioxidants, right? So if plaque's developing in the brain, we need antioxidants as well. We need things that help literally prevent free radical damage or oxidation. And antioxidants, you, so you can say the word oxidation right in there, are antioxidation-based particles. So that's important as well. Why can it help with depression, but not, again, not anxiety, not OCD, not feelings of overwhelm, but depression? Well, depression can sometimes be, if you have a low energy body, a low output because of low, let's just say norepinephrine or dopamine, coffee will help push that. It will help stimulate you, okay? Let's not take it too far, but it can help with that, okay? So a couple other things. One is I don't necessarily agree with the research on staving off type 2 diabetes. I believe that's more of a correlation, meaning that they're showing a lot of people who drink coffee don't get type 2 diabetes. I can't really agree with that because there's so many other extenuating circumstances and coffee can also increase cortisol and high cortisol can also increase high sugar. So I'm not buying that. I can't believe it. There's too many contradicting studies to say that's true. It doesn't mean that coffee's not good. It's just I'm not buying that at all. There's also some B vitamins. There's magnesium. There's niacin. There's there's other great things in coffee. Sure, do agree with that, but they're all about 10% of the RDA. So it's not like there's a high dosage of any one of those things. So again, don't drink it for your actual, your vitamins and nutrients as well. Can it help you burn more fat? Yes, it can. 
It does actually help burn more fat, but that's considering you drink it black. So that's really important to look at too, that you're not having these lattes that mix it with all different types of sugar and different things like that. We're talking about black coffee, the bitterness in black coffee. It can also help with digestion. Not very well known for that, but in Ayurvedic medicine, it is absolutely one of those things called a bitter astringent that can help with digestion. And that means just like in Europe, not in the US, we use it totally incorrectly, but it's after a meal. That's when you drink your coffee and that's when you drink it black. Why? Because it stimulates stomach acid. It creates more acidity in the stomach, which is exactly what you want after a meal. So it can help break down those proteins. So you know, those are some reasons why you may decide to use it. But now keep in mind all the reasons for why you shouldn't use it, meaning like stimulated norepinephrine, stimulating dopamine. If you have methylation-based issues or COMT-based issues where you can't actually degrade dopamine or norepinephrine, not a very good thing to use, right? So you have to be very careful. You have to look at these specific things. You can look at your genetics. You can run a, a genetic test that tells you so much information. You can look at your body type. Are you the thinner body type, the thinner joints, very small calves, a longer, thinner neck? Is that your body type? That means you're more prone to the anxiety, the overwhelm, the irritability, the overstimulation. Be careful with coffee, okay? Now, how would I use it for the general public? Now, no one has to drink coffee. So believe me, don't get on the coffee bandwagon. If you don't drink coffee now, don't start. There's no need to. But if you love coffee, you're looking for a little bit of justification. Maybe how would you use it? This is how I would use it. Only in the morning. Now, why would I say only in the morning? Here's why. Okay. And and only in the morning and not first thing right when you wake up. Do what I'm telling you. This is my greatest recommendation. Wake up. Have a glass of room temperature water or warm water or some tea. Put a little fresh squeeze of lemon in there. If you don't have histamine issues, that's an absolutely fantastic thing to do. If you have adrenal issues, you can do the fresh squeeze of lemon and a pinch of sea salt. Drink that slowly. Let your body be hydrated before you start to dehydrate it with coffee, okay? Now, after that, even before the coffee, I would have some of your daily smoothie like I recommend in the morning, then a little bit of coffee, even with it or you know, on top of that, however you want to do it. Don't jump into the day overstimulating your body with caffeine, producing adrenaline when you haven't had any food to help with that. So you're not pushing the fight or flight without any nutrients, with any fuel because once you, once you kick on fight or flight, your body's going to say, okay, where's the sugar? Where's the fuel? We're in fight or flight. We need energy. So that's why I believe to have a little bit of breakfast in there. Again, you can use it then as a digestive aid afterwards. Now, why do I say only in the morning? Here's why. When you look at the natural cortisol rhythm, when you look at the diurnal rhythm of the body, the body produces three times, approximately three times the amount of cortisol first thing in the morning when you wake up versus noon versus 4 p.m. versus before bed around 10 p.m. Really, really important to look at that. So if you have your coffee in the morning and that coffee is going to produce more adrenaline and then as a result, more cortisol, well, that goes with the natural rhythm of your body. More cortisol in the morning is totally normal. If you start to spike it again in the afternoon when it's supposed to be naturally coming down, it's going to affect your natural rhythm. It's not going to allow you to start to get into that repair mode. It's not going to allow you to get in that deep sleep at night. So all of these things do matter. I understand there are some people who are fast oxidizers and slow oxidizers of caffeine. That's a subject for a different day. I'm just giving you my recommendations, what I've seen work, and and really from 20 years of experience really looking at this as well, experimenting with myself. There was a long period of time where I couldn't drink any coffee, and the reason was it only increased anxiety. It only increased overstimulation because I was in true adrenal burnout. I had no real cortisol production at all. They call that Addison's disease and that's what I was at. And so coffee would only make it worse, of course. So you have to look at it in that way. Now I can enjoy a small cup of black coffee in the morning if I decide to. Usually for me, I like to do it maybe mid-morning if I have it, You know, maybe somewhere around the 9 or 10 o'clock hour, a couple hours after being up, so I don't just stimulate myself right away. I have my smoothie first, all those nice things, and then I enjoy it. A lot of times I might get a coffee and only drink half, and then sometimes not at all, and I just enjoy it on the weekend. So you know, look at it in that way. Just a couple things to leave you with. One is this. Make sure your coffee is organic whenever possible. I'm a realist. I understand. I live in the real world. Just keep in mind, coffee beans are so heavily sprayed. They are a pretty just dirty crop in general. If you can get organic, even better. If you're drinking decaf coffee, please make sure it is water processed, not literally 
doused with ethanol and forms of gasoline to decaffeinate it. Not a fan of that. There's something called the Swiss water process. And if you make your own, it's so simple to buy. So you can get organic, you can get the decaffeinated if you choose to. And cause just because if you're trying to wean off, a lot of times I do half decaf with people, half regular to start to wean off of all that heavy caffeine. I'll give my caffeine weaning protocol in the future if you'd like. Um, right now, I'm already over my time limit for what I try to keep it to on a day-to-day basis for the Cabral concept. So hopefully this just gave you a little bit more insight and to understand that this is how my practice works. There is no one recommendation for everyone. Does that make my practice harder? Yes. Does that make you know, teaching a little bit more difficult. Yes. But then hopefully you understand that there's no fad. There's no marketing here. There's no whatever. I'm not saying, hey, drink this coffee or drink this coffee with MCT oil or with butter or any of those things. Hey, maybe that could be good for some people, but I can tell you this, it's detrimental to put butter in your coffee or coconut oil in your coffee for some people. So that is not an all for one, just like coffee is not an all for one. Hopefully we're starting to understand that we're not all the same person. We are individuals. And once we understand that, you'll be well on your way to getting well, to maintaining that healthy weight that you want and to living longer. And that's really what it's all about. Thank you everyone for tuning in to another Cabral Concept. If you get the chance, please feel free to share this episode and any others with others that you feel it can help. That's what it's all about. It really is building community, passing this knowledge along so that other people understand that they don't have to take the same recommendations, a cookie cutter recommendation that everyone is you know, following typically from a day-to-day lifestyle. Thank you once again, everyone. I'll talk with you tomorrow. Before you go, I wanted to share a personal story with you. The real reason I began to get well finally is because I figured out what was wrong with me. And that might seem pretty obvious, but I went from doctor to doctor for over two years before discovering at-home functional medicine lab testing. These are the labs that enabled me to finally figure out what was wrong with my hormones, blood sugar, electrolytes, and gut health. And once I knew what was wrong, I could then follow a proven plan in order to rebalance my body from the inside out. This is why I believe so strongly in functional medicine lab testing and why I've made it my mission to share these labs with the world. Now at equa.life, you can order an at-home lab test or lab bundle for you and your family and be able to complete it within the week. Plus, the equal life difference is that you're not left to try to read and figure out these labs on your own. We explain what your lab numbers mean, what they mean in the much bigger picture, and then how to go about rebalancing your body in order to heal. To see our full selection of lab tests or to set up a free lab selection call to find out what labs may be best for you, simply head on over to equa.life forward slash labs. And do remember, we ship these all over the world. To find out more and to set up your free lab selection call, simply head on over to equa.life forward slash labs. That's E-Q-U-I dot L-I-F-E forward slash labs. Labs.